Guns for General Washington. Chapter 12. A New Start. The rescue party trudged blindly through the storm, and even for a husky six-footer like Henry Knox, it was a grueling march. For several miles, they struggled through snow three feet deep against a howling wind moving across country with no path or trail to guide them. Their breath came in gasps, and they floundered in deep drifts, often losing their footing. At last, exhausted and numb with cold, they staggered into still water and were taken to the home of Squire Fisher. Bowls of hot broth eaten in front of an open fire helped to revive the frozen hikers. When the squire heard Henry's story, he sent his farm hats with food and supplies to relieve the crew trapped in the pine grove. Then he lent Henry his fastest horse so the colonel could race ahead to Albany. Meanwhile, in the snow-bound grove, Will did his best to keep the animals warm and raise the men's failing spirits. He joked with young J.P., who was feeling frightened, but trying hard not to show it. By evening, the storm had passed and the wind finally died down. Henry, riding the fast mount, managed to reach Albany at last and hurried to see General Schuler. The general, who was one of the doubters, still thought the plan was crazy, but he admired the colonel's stubborn courage. Most of the horses are played out and have to be replaced, Henry said unhappily. Some of my men are sick, too, and need medical help. Schuler nodded thoughtfully. We'll take care of your sick. I'll also send a platoon into the countryside to find substitutes. I don't know how much luck we'll have, but we'll try. Henry Knox had been authorized to pay 12 shillings a day for each span of horses he hired. It was a good fee, but he found to his dismay that there were few takers. The locals all supported the rebel cause, but they knew the perils of winter and the dangers of the trail, and they were afraid to risk their animals. While Henry fretted over the delay, Schuler's men scoured the area, visiting every farm and hamlet, bargaining for teams and drivers. It took four full days before enough replacements could be found and sent to Stillwater, where Will and the others were waiting. Here the changes were made and the new teams were harnessed in place. Finally, on December 31st, the convoy was ready to move ahead. Their next goal was to get across the Mohawk River, which joined the Hudson near a town called Lansing's Ferry. The Mohawk was frozen over, and Henry expected this to be a simple operation like their earlier crossing. When they reached the riverbank, Will and several other men walked out on the ice. They drilled small holes here and there to test for thickness. Then they came back with long faces. The ice is starting to melt, Will explained to his brother. It's getting thin out toward the middle. Henry scratched his chin slowly. You think it can hold the heavy wagons, he asked. Will shook his head unhappily. Not a chance, he said. I'm afraid they'll never make it. And we'll read chapter 13 next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.